Uh, Dr. Ripley is the Healthy Oils um, Breeding Leader for Dow Agrosciences here in Saskatoon. And he's had, a, I think, a very impressive resume of accomplishment in terms of uh, plant breeding and developing novel crop products, both for consumers and, and uh, for producers. He was the lead canola breeder in the, uh, in the release of the first registered herbicide tolerant canola, and as many of us know, that was, that's having uh, herbicide uh, tolerant or resistant canola has been very important in, uh, in, in kind of advancing uh, no-till agriculture and, and crop rotations in the prairies. He also is focused on improving nutritional quality and health-promoting properties of uh, oilseed crops, been developing a number of uh, healthy oil hybrids in canola, and also in uh, Sunflower, where he was involved and in lead in the development of the world's first naturally occurring, uh, uh, naturally uh, zero saturated fat oil in Sunflower. So uh, I, I welcome uh, Dr. Ripley and his talk, short-term and long-term needs of commercial canola breeders for enhancing phenotyping tools. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today, and uh, uh, I feel a little bit like a fish out of water because uh, if you look at the posters and you look at the talks that are on, on the agenda, um, there's a lot of complicated science, obviously, behind this technology. And what I want to talk about today is really, from a commercial plant breeder's point of view, uh, at Dow AgroSciences, um, how I see sort of the short-term and longer-term applications of, of of the technology and how it can help me as a, as a practical plant breeder. Um, I often think that uh, commercial breeders were almost like the politicians of the breeding world uh, because by definition we have to have a pipeline that constantly delivers a product. There, there's no room for error of not being able to deliver that next product that will have an improvement and that we'll be able to deliver on the, co the commercial expectations of, the, uh, of your marketing group. And so from that point of view, um, you know, that, that puts extra limitations on us, particularly for taking up um, new technology. So in the short term, um, you know, really, so, so then what does that mean from, the, from, the plant breeding, from a commercial plant breeding point of view? How do I see using this technology uh, in, in the short term? And it's really about, um, and some of this goes back to what Professor Landridge was talking about, and we have quite a few common themes in our presentation, so um, sorry if I'm repeating some of these things. But um, one of the key areas where we're looking at using uh, some of these technologies in the short term is really to um, look at high throughput phenotyping, uh, focusing on standardizing our notes. Um, a lot of the types of ratings that we do, say for instance in the canola breeding program, are scale-based ratings. So um, that has two issues. So you're talking about a scale, so a one to nine scale for instance for something like early season vigor. And so there's that variability in the system. Um, it's not like taking a, a combine across the field and measuring yield. Um, and then you also have the, the plant breeder uh, variation. So within a big program, you might have five or six different breeders, and they all have, of course, their own eyes that interpret this scale in their own way. Um, so really, um, where, where we can see big value in, in this is to improve precision uh, through decreasing the subjective uh, nature of ratings. Um, and also, too, then to free up uh, breeders' times for, for more critical activities and to improve selection. Longer term, uh, really to enhance the capabilities of the technology. Right now, we see um, that it's really more towards um, some of these uh, um, uh, simpler traits. Uh, well, I'll call them simpler traits, but in terms of per perhaps lending themselves to being able to be uh, visualized digitally, um, and then longer term to some of the um, uh, other traits of importance to us. So within Dow AgroSciences, seed quality in all the crops that we breed is, is really critical. Um, so over and above the regular breeding program that you have for most canola companies in Canada, you also have to uh, make sure the products that you're delivering uh, deliver from a seed quality point of view. 
Um, and then longer term, really envirotyping and uh, enhanced breeding programs uh, by being able to generate better data, uh, reduction of experimental error, and um, looking at crop response relative to environmental factors. Currently today, I mean, we all measure genetic stability, uh, G by E interaction, but the E component is really seen as kind of a black box. And so it, it's not really predictive unless you have a, a huge uh, data set over many years um, and locations. So this is, in the short term, needs what's contributing to this, and Professor Landridge uh, made reference to it. Uh, this is a graph that you see here of uh, the canola acres in Western Canada. So it's really been quite dramatic. Um, if you look at from the 1980s up until uh, 2014 on this graph, we've had a huge increase in, in canola acres in Western Canada. And concurrently with this, there was a, a big shift from public breeders really driving the crop to private uh, companies such as mine, uh, driving the advancements in the crop. So, um, you know, what does this mean for me as a practical breeder? Um, it was mentioned earlier that as you uh, scale up your breeding program as well, then the biggest challenge you face is the evaluation of the material. How can you accurately uh, evaluate the material? How can you uh, make better selections? So I just give a little example here. So if we have a double haploid nursery with say 20,000 uh, genotypes, and this is, this is definitely um, uh, doable in most programs, if you spend five seconds per plot uh, as the breeder walking along and making, say, an early, early season vigor note, that works out to about 27.8 hours. And so if you have a 10-hour day, that's three 10-hour days. And by the end of that three 10-hour days, you're really not a happy, <laughs> happy plant breeder. Uh, plus, I mean, what's the difference between doing your ratings first thing in the morning when you're fresh and in a good mood versus later in the day when you're tired of the bugs and the heat and the dirt? So um, this, you know, really does play into the consistency of the data. Um, and uh, um, one other factor is in programs, there, if new breeders are coming into the program, there's a training phase. You have to uh, get them to the same level of rating, um, uh, rating efficiency uh, that you need for the program. So this would help to help to avoid that. So um, these are. Uh, I preface my next comments by saying that really Dow AgroSciences at at this point, I'd say we're really at the very early phase uh, within um, using this tech, using some of these technologies. So this is an example. One area where we are seeing some value is to use the technology for early season vigor. Um, you can see canola, the benefit of canola, of course, is um, uh, with the leaf color and then with the flower color. Um, there's a lot of differential colors that, that should be able to be picked up quite easily. And you can uh, look at things like early season vigor, the ability of the, oh, of the, of the plants to cover the ground uh, at a given period of time. And then also days to flower. Uh, it, it, it looks like it will be quite useful for determining uh, days to flower. And, you know, th these may, as I said, these may seem like relatively simple things to rate, but it takes a huge amount of effort to go out there day after day. For things like flowering, you often have to go there every second or third day. Um, so this will help you to zero in on specific material, parts of your populations that you're interested in. So we do see value to um, uh, using the technology in this way. Um, and here's sort of the level, uh, or the ground level view of a, of a canola double haploid nursery. And as you can see, it's an excellent crop, we think, for application of automated phenotyping. Uh, big leaf area, the flower color difference at maturity, uh, days to maturity is another good area where, um, where this makes sense. Uh, you get pod color change. And, um, and there's quite a few ratings, like I said, that we do on a scale basis like um, early season vigor or days to flower, days to maturity. <clears throat> so I'm not gonna go into this again because uh, I was sitting beside Graham Scholes and I said, well, Professor Landridge is talking about a lot of the things I was gonna talk about, so I'll just skip over this a little bit. Um, but really it's about how to, um, how to get better uh, increase in, in rate of genetic gain. Uh, all of us are fighting against that. And, um, 
and trying to manipulate these various components that uh, the Professor Landridge uh, talked about. So if you increase uh, selection accuracy, uh, this will help to increase the heritability, reduce non-genetic effects, uh, decrease environmental noise uh, in, that's, that's inherent in large-scale testing. Uh, decrease within location envir environmental spatial effects. Um, so really to help, it'll help you to optimize your experimental designs, uh, better accounting for environmental variability. <clears throat> so um, really it, uh, in the short to midterm, we do see this will help to increase throughput and accuracy and like I said, help to keep that pipeline going forward. Uh, enhancing our phenotyping ability to be more reliable on larger volumes of, of uh, germplasm uh, will allow us to recycle material quicker and therefore reduce uh, cycle time as well. Um, and right at this point, I would say that the key areas that we're looking at is uh, remote uh, phenotyping using satellites, uh, drones, um, and potentially robots. Um, and one other point I want to touch on also has been previously touched on by Professor Landridge as well is really keeping technology advancing in smaller crops. But maybe one different thing is that within Dow AgroSciences, canola is a small crop. So when, when you have, have a large company and you're talking about you know, a corn program or a soybean program, and then you talk about a canola program, we really don't get the same play time, I would say, in terms of um, of resources, development of tools, uh, et cetera. Really, these are often that will be developed in the key crops or the core crops and then be leveraged uh, to smaller crops such as canola. So um, we really need to think about then how do we, how do we develop these tools so that they, they are easily modifiable uh, to the various crops. <clears throat> Uh, longer term opportunities, I see sort of a couple of areas. One is um, how do we uh, expand the technology uh, to make it more useful um, for our needs, for, for practical breeder needs. Um, and as I mentioned, we're working on seed quality in everything that we do. And so really um, incorporation of tools around seed quality, uh, oil, protein, fatty acid profile in the field, if, if that's possible. This can help to reduce uh, the material that has to be harvested from the field and really help um, make sure that, that you're uh, advancing enriched material. Um, it's a huge potential savings to the program uh, and also it, it will give enhancement of precision and acceleration of trait mapping. Um, one other area that we have started to do a little bit of work in, uh, but it's very embryonic at this point, I would say, it would be disease reaction. So how do you, um, how do you use uh, these automated methods uh, to look at early disease reaction or uh, adult plant uh, disease reaction? And then uh, towards the end here, um, longer term, and really this is, um, is quite a ways in the future, I would say, uh, would be envirotyping. So ZOO uh, defines envirotyping as related to all environmental factors that affect plant growth and yield, and uh, that those are really the environment types. And so um, areas where we can probably start, or we are, where we already are starting to apply the technology is improved site selection. And so this is related to things like topography, moisture, fertility. Um, this helps to reduce uh, experimental error and allow for better predictions um, of environmental effects. And then crop response uh, to the main environmental factors. So like I said, what, with the G by E uh, work that we're doing today, the E portion is kind of a black box. And so really out of these various uh, areas, uh, what are the key factors that we need to focus on? And then ultimately, um, we, we need to be able to close the loop between the breeding programs. Uh, and commercial production. So we know that in, in several ways, um, commercial production is already a bit ahead uh, in terms of um, uh, companies like John Deere and others uh, that have developed uh, tools to help farmers manage, uh, manage things like crop inputs um, uh, and, and those type of factors. Uh, but 
you know, I would say as a commercial breeder, at best, there's only anecdotal feedback uh, to the breeding program in terms of uh, this is really a critical factor, you need to work towards this, and that will improve the overall performance of, of your product. So that's what I mean by we need to look at how do we close, uh, close this loop. And ultimately then it will help uh, product placement and ensure greater success uh, for growers. And I'll stop with that. <laughs>